morning, guys. It's 8 a.m., so we'll get started. Uh, and just uh, to uh, highlight for, for all of you guys, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got stuff going on this week. We've got three weeks until the AP test takes place. Our AP test is on May 15th. Um, I'm working on your DBQs currently. Your DBQs, I was able to get through period one. Um, I'm planning on doing period two and four, hopefully today. Um, but to buy myself some time, I'm planning on getting those DBQs finished, and then we can review them on Wednesday, so we can talk about uh, talk about your writing at that time. Um, I would love to get them done today, and if possible, I'd like to get them back into your hands. So when you get them back, you should uh, get back from me a, a rubric that is scored out with comments on it, um, and then you'll be able to take a look at the submission that you ran through Turnitin. So you'll be able to put the you'll be able to put the two pieces together. And then like I've done with the past, I'll be uh, sharing with you an example essay so you guys can see what good writing looks like. Um, let me see here. Where can we see the scores? Um, you will see them on your rubric when you get uh, your rubric from me. And then eventually I'll be putting them into the grade book uh, once I get done with everybody's. So that's a, a really good question. It's not going to be something that's scored out on Schoology. Um, it'll just be thrown into the grade book. I'm using Schoology to check it as a plagiarism checker. Um, but it doesn't line up with the rubric uh, very nicely. And so I'm just using it as a tool to make sure that you aren't lifting stuff from the internet or other sorts of sources to, to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do. Um, let me show you what we're working on today then. And, and the insights that I've got uh, for, for us um, is very similar to what I've seen in other classes three weeks out from the AP test. And so um, I'm not worried about anything from the standpoint of like your ability levels. You're the same ability levels as every other class that we've ever had. The, the problem that we've got um, is the fact that you're being assessed with one DBQ. And, and so you're, you're walking on a tightrope uh, when it comes to that, uh, that skill point. And that skill is the hardest of the skills to be able to pull off well. So in the past, um, as 10th graders competing against 11th graders, um, we could bank on the idea that we could really build up your ability to do multiple choice testing, short answer testing, um, and then if the DBQ was a struggle at the time of the AP test, that wouldn't sabotage our scores. Um, we're now in the opposite situation where the DBQ is, is what we're hinging our points on. Um, to be fair, though, uh, for everybody in the country, the DBQ is hard. So the average school score nationwide when there are no notes available is a two. What I was doing this past week, though, is I wanted to see um, under the pressure of time, what does that do to your writing? And it did what, ex what I expected it to do. Um, there was fears that teachers had around the country that there would be rampant cheating. Um, and you can try to attempt that, but in a 45 minute window to try to cheat and then try to take the time to write out a good essay, um, I'm not seeing a lot of that. I'm seeing instead a lot of kids who are crunched with the time limits that they have. And we have to figure out a couple different things uh, to make your situation better than to hopefully help you out. So number one, we got to get your content tighter. And that was the thing that was obvious in grading out one section um, is that a lot of people, when they got into that time setting, uh, started writing document driven essays where it was just document one says this, document two says this without a whole lot of outside information or your own personal analysis going on. Um, and that's what we're looking for in our grading because when we see that, we recognize that your rubric score is going to be really low. Um, you may summarize enough documents to be able to be okay, but if all you're doing is summarizing documents, you're going to be in a pretty rough spot. So like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, you should have a book, something like this. You can still order them through Amazon. We just got done uh, looking at one for my daughter for AP Bio. Uh, the arrive date is, I believe, early next week. So that I means it's still two weeks out from the deadline. But a book like this is key, especially since for many of you guys, the content is so old that they give you inside these books, not just practice tests or other sorts of things. They've also got for you readings like this that will help you to be able to understand the content and refresh your memory about what it is that you guys studied months ago. You've also got opportunities to use flashcards like this. These are huge, especially being able to grind out content because for many of you guys, when you were writing your essays, it was obvious that if you could just slip in specific names, dates, facts, or whatever, that could be pulled from flashcards where you just get something that says like Albany plan on one side has all the details on the other side. There are many of you guys who learned this stuff back in the fall. Um, it's not stuck well enough for you to have it in your automatic recall, which doesn't make you a bad student. It just means you haven't rehearsed it. You are now kind of like an actor or an actress or a musician or an athlete who needs to rehearse over and over again to perform on the spot. 
So when I was coaching my kids' basketball teams, we would try to run basketball plays, and you'd see the basketball plays break down because they knew what play we would call. They just wouldn't be able to do it as a, as a reflex. And so you'd see them, we'd call a certain play, and they would hesitate for a second, and then they'd start moving. And by the time they started moving, the opportunity to score was gone uh, because of the fact that they just hesitated rather than acting on instinct. That's really what we have to build up for you guys is we've already done the teaching in class. All the stuff that I've done to this point is now gotten you to the place where if you really ramp up your review over the next few weeks, you can then strengthen your ability to do well on the AP test. It's that rehearsal piece, though, where it's taking something that you, you're you aware of, but you're not solid with and making it better that we have to get better with. We're going to be doing activities then as we move, move forward to make that better. So let me highlight a few different things for you. Number one, after grading your DBQs, we are definitely going to push back your chapter 40 and 41 notes until after the AP test. Chapter 39 is due today, but chapters 40 and 41, I'm going to be collecting after the AP test, and I do not need you to read those before the AP test. Um, for post-contextualization, we should have enough information to be able to help you out with the test itself. But secondarily, we got bigger fish to fry, and in the three weeks that I've got left, um, we really got to work on, on uh, reviewing periods three through seven content, making connections over time periods, uh, running themes, um, because from what I saw with the DBQs on, on Friday and Saturday when I was grading them, um, we do have th some things content-wise that we do need to make them a, a lot better. You do have a homework assignment that is due for tomorrow, though. So by 8 a.m. tomorrow, you've got an activity that I'm going to want you to get done. And so it's going to be something that you are self-checking. And here's what I would like you to do. If you click on this link, this is the way that we typically start up our review process to get ready for the AP test to give you a really broad shotgun uh, blast uh, approach to, to trying to get content done in, in, a, in a chunk. So if you open up this document right here, you're going to find a document called Decades Association. What I'm going to want you to do today is I'm going to want you to make a copy of this document. So go up here, make a copy. So you got your own. You'll be submitting your copy. And what I'm going to want you to do is I'm going to want you to run this list before 8 a.m. tomorrow, which is when I want you to submit. And over here on the side, I just want you to type in what you think the decade is that these events took place. I want you to have a notebook handy. And so what I would like you to do is when you're going through this, you should understand that all of the events that you see happening right here happen within a certain decade. You will have certain uh, time periods that are bigger though. So in the colonial times, we don't need to be so narrow as far as our focus with the decades themselves. So what I would want you to do is if it's coming from like colonial time periods, I would like you to chunk it into these chunks right here. But in particular, what I would like you to do is when you take a look at Long Hot Summers, Freedom Summer, Greensboro Sit-ins, U2 Incident, and Detente, this all happened in the 1960s. We're trying to get you into the mindset of chronological reasoning where you're able to say that these events happened during this time period, they all happened together. And then if you see certain events from periods three through seven, so period three, is around the time of the French and Indian War. Uh, period seven is wrapping up in 1945. So if you have any events that are happening from 1754 to 1945, where you look at them and you're like, I have no clue what that thing is, jot it down in your notebook, Google search it, make sure that you're good with it. This is meant to give you a chance to refresh your content before the AP test actually happens. I'm also gonna want you to check your work. So I would like you to take a shot over here. So run through all of these today and jot down what years, what decades you think these took place. And then I want you to check. And if you get one wrong, all I want you to do is when you make a copy, when I grade it out, I'm gonna be looking to see that you've got typed over here the year that this took place. And so if I put down 1950s and then I Google search it later and I realize, oops, no, that's 1960s. All I wanna see you do is in a different color, put down the time frame that you think that this took place. And the reason why you're doing this, there are some kids who get so embarrassed about getting questions wrong that they will just obliterate the first answer, put in the right answer, turn into something that is 100%. I want to see how close you are with your chronological reasoning. And so if you're off by 50 years, 
and a bunch of kids in the class are the same, this will give me data as far as what I need to do to review chronologically to help you guys out. If you realize that you were off the first time, that little bit of shame that you feel is not shame that I'm going to have about you. Instead, we are all on a progression to get better with our content knowledge. And so if it turns out you made a mistake, we want to highlight that so we're able to come back and fix that up over time. Um, but this is a really good place that my kids will typically use as an opportunity to then build up their chronological knowledge. And then also they'll be able to figure out things like if you don't remember Sacco and Vanzetti that we studied back in February, that's okay. Now's the time to fix that. The only time it becomes bad that you don't know something is when we get to the actual AP test. Um, and at that time, it's going to be too late. And so if we can do anything to fix that, that would be great. So again, have this done, submitted by 8 a.m. tomorrow. You will find on Schoology that there is a spot for you to turn this in already. You will find that there's a deadline that's over on the, the right-hand side right here. And you'll find it at the bottom of your Schoology activities down here. And I've opened them up already to make sure that they're open for submission. So you shouldn't run into any sort of problems. If you ever do run into problems with submissions, though, what that typically means is I just haven't opened the Schoology uh, uh, link for you uh, to start accepting uh, responses. So just let me know if that ever happens. We're going to be working today, though, with your concept outline. So if you can take out your period seven concept outline and have your notes handy, we're going to be wrapping up your content review to go over what you should be noticing in the concept outline itself. And in particular, you should also have handing your, handy your John Irish style guide uh, that we've worked with previously so we can take a look at how do we use this to help you guys to get into a better spot when it comes to actually preparing for the AP test. So I'll give you a second to get both of those things set to go. And in particular, what we're going to be looking at today is how do you prep for essay writing? When it comes to the essay writing on the AP test, our scores in the past for the AP test have not become come because of the fact that I'm doing anything special in class. It's just me laying out for you different ideas as far as what you could work on. And then I have students in the past um, who would take advantage of that. They would go and they would study uh, reviewing the things that are potential areas of problems on the AP test. And that's where our best scores would come from as kids just kind of following those, those avenues down. So when we take a look at the John Irish style guide, the two things I want to highlight for you is number one, he has a page that references course themes. This is directly from the concept outline from the College Board. And when you look at these themes, this is what your essay test is going to be based on. Your DBQ is going to be revolving around questions like American and national identity, work exchange and technology, geography and the environment, migration and settlement, politics and power, America and the world, America and regional culture and social structures. The essay that you were working with last week was the question of how did tensions over slavery impact our, our uh, uh, political systems inside the United States? Um, and in essence, what that essay was revolving around was the idea that for at the start of the time period in the 1830s, during the Jackson presidency, you had Democrats and Whigs. Um, eventually, the Whigs disintegrate, the Democrats disintegrate, they sectionalize, the Republicans pop up. Um, and that's what they were asking you to explore inside your DBQ. And so that theme is what they were asking you to run. And for a lot of kids, they would write down stuff about like westward expansion and, and uh, the, the characteristics of slavery, all of which could go into this essay. But the theme that the essay question was asking you to focus on was politics and power. What impact did slavery have on our political systems that we had in the United States? How did it create tensions in our politics? And so that's going to be our key is if you didn't see that with the essay question, you got yourself into a dangerous area where it, become, it becomes harder and harder to write an essay that is going to satisfy the rubric if you miss what theme you're supposed to be exploring. Now, if you're thinking about preparing for the AP test, then the John Irish style guide is great because of the fact that when it comes to each of the essay types, you're going to have a specific historical skill that you're going to be asked to write about. One is historical causation. They'll either ask you to talk about the multiple causes that led to something or the effects of a certain event in U.S. history. He then gives to you different prompts. So it says, explain the relative importance of causes which led to. You could easily prepare yourself then over the next few weeks by playing the game of just inserting things into, into this blank. The causes of 
the American Civil War, the causes of the Industrial Revolution, the causes of the creation of the 19th Amendment, explain the relative importance of effects which resulted from the ending of World War I, the Great Depression. I mean, you, it's, it's pretty easy to utilize these prompts by just inserting facts into them and then kind of running forward to see, can you actually play out an essay using this sort of style, ca multiple causes leading to effect or multiple effects uh, that are coming from a beginning starting point. If you go further, compare contrast, this is the uh, second of the three skills you'll be asked to show on, on a DBQ. They could ask you to talk about, uh, compare like the Gilded Age and the Roaring Twenties or compare the Progressive Era with the, with the uh, New Deal or do a contrast in the same sort of way. So this is something where you can be looking during your review, what things seem to be comparisons, what things seem to be contrasts that could play themselves in an essay style. Finally, continuity and change over time. Take any sort of event in U.S. history and play out the question of what would happen uh, if, you, if you took a look at this as a turning point moment and then considered afterwards what things changed, what things stayed the same. Keep in mind it's going to run a theme, though, so you'd be thinking about what things changed economically as a result of the, how much did things change economically as a result of the Civil War. Um, how much did things uh, change politically as a result of, of the progressive era? And what you'll find is there's often elements inside that essay question where some things will change, some things will stay the same. Exploring both is going to be what gives you the credit that you're looking for. So when we're working our way through period seven, then this is our last time period that we have to worry about as far as a focal point for the AP test. Um, and in particular, what we're looking at now is we're trying to figure out content and uh, essay questions that might pop up. And finally, post-contextualization. So when we think about what we've studied since period seven, uh, this would be uh, the, the uh, 1950s, uh, Cold War, uh, Korea, Vietnam, um, uh, the civil rights movement. And I think what we're going to find is that the majority of the topics that we're about to explore have post-contextualizations after 1945 that we've already explored to the point where the rest of the textbook is going to be useful for us as we wrap up our course. Um, but at this point, we've got bigger fish to fry. So as we start at period seven, 1890 to 1945, um, the dates that you see on the front of this sheet, <coughs> excuse me, allergies are terrible, um, is, is first of all, um, exploring the, the changes that happen as a result of reform movements. 1890 is given to you because that's when you have uh, farmer movements, Panic of 1893, the populist rise. Um, and even though the populists are focused on silver, um, they also are focused on other sorts of reforms that become keys to the progressive era, whether it is breaking up monopolies, creation of an income tax, or a whole host of other sorts of things that, that they didn't accomplish but are done as we move into the next time period. That's why they give you 1890 as the beginning starting point so you can talk about local and state origins for what was going on with progressivism. <coughs> Sorry. All right. So first of all, contextualization. And remember, contextualization, and this is a problem that I saw still with the DBQs that I graded out this past weekend. When you are doing a contextualization, you can't just announce what stuff happened before an event took place. Um, like when I was reading about the issues of slavery, I was reading <coughs> one essay that was talking about uh, the Three-Fifths Compromise and how that took place before uh, 1830. Um, when we were supposed to be talking about slavery and its impact on politics. There's nothing wrong with anything that the student wrote about the Three-Fifths Compromise. Um, the key question, though, is so what? And it's great that you're mentioning that the North and the South got involved in political battles. Um, but if you were able to explain that the essay question wasn't quite right, that even though from the period of 1830 to 1860, um, you had a rise in political tension because of slavery, um, the student who's writing about the Three-Fifths Compromise, if they add in a component that said this debate had been going on for years in the past and the stuff that we were looking at inside their essay was just the latest episode of that. But even during the constitutional process, 
um, they were still wrestling with that sectional divide over how we should view slavery, that would be a contextualization. And so for many kids, we're really close when it comes to contextualization. And it mentions here, explain the context <clears throat> in which America grew into its role as a world power. Each of these things helped America to become a global power during the early 1900s. It mentions here that as our growth expanded opportunity, but it also led to economic instability. It led to reform efforts during this time period. And during that time, we saw our farmers moving more and more into the city. And that movement is happening because of the industrial revolution. You've got industrialization happening on the farm with like the McCormick Reaper and also the invention of the tractor in the late 18, early 1900s. Um, if, and use the railroads that led to many kids moving off the farm and into the city to look for factory jobs. As we look at this time period, though, we will find that when we have economic downturns, it sometimes will lead to changes inside of our country. And in particular, we saw that reforms came in the early 1900s in response to the Panic of 1893, the, uh, the assassination of McKinley that led Teddy Roosevelt becoming the president of the United States. And you had saw the growth of the federal government getting involved in reform efforts. <clears throat> Expanding further on this key concept about how America put reforms into their economic system, during the Roaring Twenties, we had a massive boom economically, but then that bubble burst. And in the 1930s, we saw a counter-revolution against the Roaring Twenties. We saw Hoover try to expand the power of the government, and then FDR really expand the power of the government, um, which got the government much more involved into the regulation of the economy. We will find also that during this time period, we have new technologies that are coming on the scene, and those new technologies are gonna cause tons of changes, and they do want to be able to play around with the idea that we have a new culture that's emerging, urban, with technological innovations, but we are having battles over these elements that you see right here, especially as that battle is between urban and rural areas. And we have tensions between science and religion, as you saw with the Scopes trial um, over the teaching of evolution inside of schools. And so while we have a ton of change, um, for some, the change is welcome. For others, the change is pretty threatening. We will also find that when it comes to immigration during this time period, we decide to put a halt to major immigration in the 1920s with our National Origins Acts because we're afraid of what immigration means inside the country. It can mean the introduction of, of people with different views, uh, different bathroom backgrounds, different ethnicities. But what will happen is as a result of all of these trends that we see happening right here, we see the building of a massive industrial power and also a massive amount of agricultural production that we saw causing problems in the late 1800s by driving down prices. <clears throat> we saw then though, that America starts getting involved in foreign policy in a much more assertive sort of way. You learned about imperialism, then our involvement in World War I, we had a period of isolationism, but then as we enter into World War II, that's where we enter into the position of not just being a major world power, but after World War II, America becomes known as a superpower um, because of its economic power, military power, and nuclear capabilities. So when they play around with this question, explain the context in which America grew into its role as a world power, it is that development of our factory structure, our farm structure, um, the government's involvement in the economy and our increasing involvement in the world uh, that is going to lead us there. So as we move forward, notice the theme that they have at the top right here. This is alerting you that you could easily get this as an essay question to, uh, to uh, get into a, a discussion about the ideas of, in this case, imperialism. Now, if we think about imperialism, imperialism running forward, um, is a foreign policy viewpoint, which means if you link your way forward from, from the period of like Teddy Roosevelt, McKinley, Spanish-American War, working your way forward, you've got the potentials to make links to World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, 
Cold War. That's what I want you to be thinking about when you're looking at a, a situation like this. When they alert you to this theme, you should run this theme backwards and forwards to think about what you might want to use as contextualizations. But you need to think about the fact that your essay question is going to be related to something like this. Explain the similarities and differences in attitudes about the nation's proper role in the world. So this is about the debates of over imperialism. So what you'll want to notice is these two terms. They do want to be able to compare and contrast imperialists and anti-imperialists. Remember that in this case, the imperialists win. So the imperialists are going to argue that because of the ending of the West in the 1890s, we the, the United States has conquered uh, the, the Western territories. Native Americans have been forced onto reservations. Um, and so many people see what's going on with imperialism as an extension of manifest destiny. It's, it isn't manifest destiny itself. It's got, just got similarities. Some people want to conquer new territories because they want to trade. Remember, we've got high tariffs during this time period, which makes it hard to trade with foreign countries. But if we conquer those countries, whether it's uh, Puerto Rico, Philippines, Cuba, Guam, uh, open door policy with China, we can trade with them freely without tariffs and we can get raw materials. There are also people who believe that America is, is ethnically, racially, religiously better than other countries, and it's our duty to spread that to other places. There are some who see the competition with uh, European empires who have already conquered Africa, uh, Asia, the Middle East, um, as, a, as a cause for us to get involved in this. Um, and please remember the name Alfred Mahan. Mahan was the guy that you guys read about who uh, wrote about the power of the Navy um, in the modern military. And so he was emphasizing the idea of building a Panama Canal to create one gigantic Navy. He wanted to take over islands around the world so that we could have naval bases to move our boats around the world easily. Um, and, and he's going to be a huge influence up through World War II. Um, and in World War II, his importance is going to get weakened a bit as we start moving from water power to air power instead. Our anti-imperialists have a wide variety of different individuals who are involved with them. Uh, some are involved in the highest uh, viewpoints of the United States, like Jane Adams is going to argue that being imperialistic is not at all um, what our country's values were founded on. Um, others are going to be concerned about conquering uh, countries that are have populations that aren't white, um, because they're fearful of what that will do to racial uh, situations in the United States, especially the extension of rights to people who are not white. Um, uh, there's concerns also about what this will do to tariffs and trade. So this is kind of a mishmash of different people who have nitpicks about imperialism. The imperialists are going to win, though. And when we think about the effects of the Spanish-American War, that you can get into the causes of the Spanish-American War. They're the ones that we saw with the imperialists up above. They were concerned about Cuba. They were worried that they were being dominated by the Spanish. Some wanted to take over the islands uh, the Spanish held because we had American interests that were already there involved in plantation work or whatever. Um, some wanted those places for naval bases. We want to notice, though, that the American victory in this war gave us multiple islands, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Philippines, Guam. It also gives us islands across the ocean that allows us to uh, get involved in China. Um, we eventually get into the Philippine-American War, where we are going to dominate the Philippines and make them into a, terra, into a possession of the United States. Um, but then if we run it forward, we are also at this point becoming much more involved in a foreign policy um, that we haven't embraced in the past. It's going to lead us to the Roosevelt corollary, where Roosevelt is going to argue that if there are uh, uh, issues going on in Latin American countries, it's the American duty to step in and intervene. And that also means the American power is getting bigger. We build the Great White Fleet and we send it around the globe during Teddy Roosevelt's presidency um, to try to influence the foreign policy of other countries and this is a baby step into what George Washington advised us against, um, where George Washington, very much with his neutrality proclamation, said, stay out of European politics and European land wars. Um, our movement into imperialism means that we are going to be butting heads against imperial powers, especially Germany, who has now become very much 
uh, influential as they get bigger. As we look at the progressive era then, notice that this is a theme that plays around with politics and power. So you could easily be asked a question like compare and contrast the progressive era with the Gilded Age. Or you could be asked about the causes for what changed us politically from laissez-faire economics to a much more liberal viewpoint of reform during this time. And so we want to be able to play around with this question, compare the goals and effects of the progressive reform movement. And so remember what we taught about in class when we came to the progressives. We want to be able to talk about muckrakers like they have right here. You had people who were publishing these, these publications. And whether it was Jacob Reese making a photo book of what the poor look like in the book, How the Other Half Lived, to the jungle with Upton Sinclair explaining what food you were eating and what the work conditions look like. Um, you had many people who were in society who were already involved in a reform effort in the 1890s as what was known as the social gospel. Most famous of them is Jane Addams, who's working inside the city to help out immigrants that nobody seems to care about, but she's creating these settlement houses that are almost like community centers to teach people English and how to get skills and how to interact with other people um, to help them to get mainstreamed um, when nobody else seems interested. You should notice as far as the reason why the progressives pop up though, the, the uh, panic of 1893 has a huge impact leading to progressivism where many people who believed in social Darwinism who were in the middle class get cleaned out by an economic downturn. We are watching right now in our politics where we now have an economic downturn happening because of the coronavirus. And we have many people who are pushing to go back to work, not because it's, it's really safe to go back to work at this time. They're just an economic condition where they were okay with the status quo, but now having been unemployed for a number of weeks, many people are finding themselves at their end um, and they need to go back to work because of how desperate their economic situation is. Um, many of those same types of people back in the 1890s had been fairly conservative about laissez-faire economics, and now they become more liberal, not wanting like communism and socialism, but they do see reforms that they want to put into place. We also are going to find, though, that during this time period, the progressives are going to be liberal in some ways, but for the issue of civil rights, you're going to find that some people like Teddy Roosevelt are willing to meet with Booker T. Washington, but when he faces opposition, he's going to back off. Some like Woodrow Wilson are thoroughly racist and believe that the KKK were the good guys during Reconstruction. So we're going to find that during this time period of the progressive era, the civil rights leaders are on their own. And this is when uh, W.E.B. Du Bois will build the NAACP to push for civil rights legislation and, and movement. We'll also find then that during this time period, some people during the progressive era are also disagreeing as far as what should be happening politically. Should we emphasize the common people or reliance on experts? And when you remember the progressives, remember the characteristics that made up progressives during this time period, white, middle to upper income, typically college educated, and their viewpoint was that the government can be used to reform the society in good ways and to do for people things that they can't do on their own. We will also find that during this time period, there's a, a concern about immigration, especially during the end, end of the 1910s, when we have a red scare and a backlash because of our fears against communism. We will find then that for the progressives, the progressives are going to try to make a good amount of change happen during this time period. They will run into a uh, conservative resistance though to making changes. And so we will see that there are amendments added to the constitution um, to try to cement changes into place. And the most notable of them would be the income taxes created during this time period. Um, you will also have the right for women to vote. They will make alcohol illegal. So there's a flurry of amendments that happen after uh, the progressive era gets started to try to cement and change. You will also be expected to understand what's going on environmentally during this time period. And the two terms that you'll want to be able to use are preservationists and conservationists. There are people who are concerned about what's happening to the environment because of our economics, that there is really no incentive for businesses to be good stewards of the environment um, because of the fact that they are, are trying to get access to resources 
um, trying to make money off of those resources, um, if they are, are interested in being eco-friendly, they can be, um, but there's nothing really mandated by the government to force them to be. Um, and so for many people during this time period, they see our environmental uh, 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 beautiful places uh, in danger of being destroyed forever. Um, preservationists are like people like John Muir, who believe we should set aside land um, to be not touched by human beings. Um, that's not going to be the model that we use, though, for our national park system created by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he's going to be a conservationist. We should set aside places so they can't be uh, utilized uh, by businesses. Other places can be, though, because our economy needs to keep running. Um, but places like the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, and whatever, we're going to make sure that those places are taken care of, conserved, um, as, so for future generations, with like parks and paths and other sorts of things to allow people to enjoy them. What I would make note of then is if you got this essay question, a post-contextualization could be FDR's program of the CCC. When he's looking to employ people who are unemployed, he starts hiring kids that are your age to go camp out in places along the North Shore, and they're going to build up an area like Gooseberry Falls so that you can still go and see that decades later using the trails that they built out to try to conserve that area for future generations. We now get to World War I, and with World War I, we are going to find that America gets drawn into foreign policy in Europe in a betrayal of what George Washington's neutrality proclamation was. What we want to keep in mind, though, is George Washington's neutrality proclamation was made for a country that was very weak, that had very little going for it, either economically or militarily. America is quite different when we move into this time period. And also the world has gotten smaller based on communication and also transportation. So notice what they want to be able to do, causes and effects of American involvement in World War I. You want to be able to think about this not just from the military standpoint, but also from the domestic standpoint, what was happening here in the United States. So here are the dates that you should consider. We, are, we have World War I from 1914 to 1918. America's involvement is only 1917 to 1918. Prior to that, we're trying to trade with the countries that are at war, but we've got a dilemma going on where we're not able to trade freely with all countries uh, because of a blockade that the British have thrown onto our goods. We are going to enter into the conflict, though, and once we get involved, that is going to be a transition for Woodrow Wilson. So initially, he announces neutrality. In 1960, his campaign promise was that he kept us out of wars. In 1917, though, we're going to have Germany violate its Sussex pledge. So remember that the Germans had been targeting boats. They blew up the Lusitania. They blew up the Sussex. When they did so, America got them to promise not to use their U-boats again in 1915. And they did that all the way until 1917. And in 1917, a couple elements took place. So when we get into the causes of World War I, in 1917 first, Russia drops out of the war. They become communists. Vladimir Lenin is held back to Russia by Germany. He makes a communist revolution take place. And when he does so, this is going to cause the Russians to drop out. Germany can throw all their forces at the Western Front against England and France. And if we don't jump into the war, England and France are going to lose. Germany will dominate all of Western Europe, which frightens the United States. The countries that we've lent money to in England and France will not be able to repay us, which makes us very nervous. Um, and when Germany had invaded Belgium, a neutral country, there was a, a very much a, a feeling inside the United States that the Germans were the bad guys in this conflict. Even worse, the Germans start attacking our boats again with U-boats, and they have the Zimmerman note that tells the Mexican government that if they want to attack the United States and distract the United States, they would be held to regain their territories that they lost during the Mexican-American War. Mexico had already been a problem for Woodrow Wilson prior to this time because we learned about three different diplomacies, big stick diplomacy with Teddy Roosevelt, dollar diplomacy with uh, William Howard Taft, and moral diplomacy with, with, with Woodrow Wilson, the idea there are good and bad countries. So when it comes to Woodrow Wilson and his entry into the war, what you'll want to be able to talk about is his 14 points plan, where he talks about no secret agreements, 
no no uh, building up of militaries, uh, uh, creating a, a League of Nations so we won't have wars again in the future. And this was all the stuff that Woodrow Wilson saw going on in Europe was what we played around with with our war or peace gaming class. When America enters into the war, we're able to stop a final offensive by the Germans to, towards Paris. But when we get into the negotiations after World War I, Woodrow Wilson overestimates how impressive he's going to be at these negotiations. He doesn't get his 14 points. He does get the League of Nations. But remember with the League of Nations, what happens with, uh, with the Treaty of Versailles that turns off Republicans are these things. Number one, if we join the League of Nations, it's an agreement that says if any country in the League gets attacked, we treat it as an attack on the United States. That means that we are deeply enmeshed in European affairs, like George Washington told us not to be. There's also a problem that's going on in the League of Nations, where when we were negotiating, Woodrow Wilson did not bring along any Republicans from Congress to negotiate with them. He felt like he should do so on his own. And he ignored the fact that there were Republicans who had legit concerns and he also ignores the fact that there are Republicans who want to compromise with him and negotiate, um, but he wants to dig in and stick with the deal that was created at Versailles. And as a result, we get nothing out of this. So when it comes to the consequences of World War I, Germany is punished. England and France are going to demand that in their treaty negotiations. England and France owe us tons of money. And they're not going to be able to repay that because of the high tariffs that we're going to create in the 1920s after Woodrow Wilson's progressive era had reduced them. So if we bu buzz back to the progressive era, remember the changes that took place during this time period. We saw Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson working down monopolies. We saw them doing things to try to lower tariffs like the Underwood tariff. We created the Federal Reserve System to try to have the government involved in the future economic developments. When we get done with World War I, though, there is a feeling in the United States that we need to have a return to normalcy. And what that means is we're going to pull back from Europe, but there's also a feeling that we went too far during the progressive era. So all those things that got built up, you've got politicians who aren't interested in utilizing uh, those techniques in the way that the progressives planned. Now, here on the home front, Pay attention to this theme of many different themes. So when they talk about migration and settlement, there is movement in the United States, especially the great migration of African-Americans from South to North. So they do want to be able to explain migration patterns that happen during this time period. Number one, we want to be able to notice that there is a fear of people from outside the country. We have a red scare. And as African-Americans move north, we have a red summer of hate, both happening at the end of World War I. We're going to see a massive peak of immigration prior to World War I. But during World War I, there becomes this fear of immigrants, especially people from Southern and Eastern Europe, and especially as a wave of radicalism happens after World War I is done. Soldiers come home from war looking for jobs. They can't find them. Labor unions start protesting, strikes break out, um, and Russia becomes communist. So we're going to see immigration booming, a backlash during World War I, and then the creation of bans to immigration, especially from Asia, where we put on a hard, complete ban. And from Southern and Eastern Europe, we have the Quota Acts of the 1920s. We do need workers during this time period. So we bring in men, women, uh, African-Americans from the South start moving North. Um, and we will find that with this great migration, African-American populations in the North will grow. But like I mentioned, we do experience what's known as the Red Summer of Hate in 1919 and the rebirth of the KKK in the 1920s as a backlash in the South and the North to African-Americans trying to move up in society. In the 1920s then, they do want to understand what technologies came on the scene what caused technology to gain, and what were the effects of technology in the 1920s. So make sure you can run through a list like you see here, radio, movies, cars, ra uh, 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 airplanes, uh, mass, uh, mass production techniques come on the scene like Henry Ford, skyscrapers, electricity, 
um, make sure you can run the list of things that were created and explain what caused these changes. And the ch changes are coming, especially because we build up these huge factories during World War I that can build guns and planes and bombs. After World War I, they can make stuff like radios and cars. Um, we will find that when Americas are, Americans are working in the 1920s, laissez-faire economics is going to make it so that businesses are booming. Many people have jobs. And remember, we keep our interest rates incredibly low, so it's super easy to be able to borrow money to buy stuff like cars or radios or homes or even stock on the stock market by buying on margin. When we take a look at our cultural and political controversies during this time period, getting into the causes and effects of internal migration, we will find that as many people start moving into the cities, the majority of Americans will then be moving into city centers, which leads to a lot of change taking place. And a lot of that cultural tension will create tensions inside the United States between urban rural folks we also have a nativistic backlash against immigrants who are coming into the United States. And as a result, when it comes to cultural and political controversies, we will find that culturally there is a rise of African Americans in the Harlem Renaissance. But then notice the controversies that are emerging during this, during this time period. Controversies over gender roles. And if you want to be able to talk about like flappers and jazz, that would be great. There's battles over modernism, especially when it comes to the battles between science and religion. The Scopes trial would be a great one to be able to talk about. Um, getting into issues over race and immigration, the Sacco and Vanzetti case, uh, where you had two immigrants who were uh, convicted and executed largely because of them being immigrants. The, the court case was rushed, the trial was, was not thorough. Um, and as a result, you had a, a backlash taking place against immigrants because there was a fear of all of these immigrants who were coming at the same time. So let me see here, Sophia, uh, I see your question from a few minutes ago. Uh, what were the three types of diplomacy? Big stick, dollar, and moral diplomacy are correct. Um, and you can easily see them playing out as we go through our foreign policy that we've covered to this point. Um, especially if you think about what was going on with like the Vietnam conflict, you've got the embodiment of all three um, massive military power dropping bombs on a small country like Vietnam, trying to bring our uh, uh, democratic and also our, our uh, economic systems to, to Vietnam uh, would be fantastic. Uh, what was the name of the immigrant? Or do you, I think you mean trial. Um, the immigrant trial is the Sacco and Vanzetti case, uh, where you have two Italian anarchists who are accused of killing somebody during a robbery, um, we're pretty certain with forensic evidence that one of the two was guilty. One of the others, one of the uh, two was most likely innocent, though. Um, but the judge before the trial ever gets started uh, essentially told everybody that they just need to speed things up because he knew they were guilty. And the trial was very much then rigged in ways to make sure that they didn't get the failed, fair trial that they were supposed to be getting. They do want to be able to explain the causes of the Great Depression and its impact on the economy. And so let me run you through the things that took place during this time. Number one, we had a huge reliance on, on moving towards an urban industrial economy, and we were dependent on farmers to be able to feed the people inside the cities, ignoring the fact that the farmers for decades had been struggling with, with uh, uh, debts that they could not pay off because the price of their products kept dropping. So think back to your farm game that we played uh, back in, in January, and you'll have a really good handle of what's taking place here. For these farmers, they were encouraged during World War I to buy tractors and land to be prepared to feed both America and Europe. And then we're in World War I for one year, and then we're out. And all these farmers then have brand new tractors with brand new bills that they have to pay off to the bank. And we especially want to notice what's going on with credit during this time period. As we take a look at the economy we've just had for the past decade, um, there have been people who have been pointing out that our stock market has never been higher um, than it is currently or has been currently. But you'll also notice that inside of our country right now, one of the dangers of, of our current situation is uh, the pressure that people are feeling because there's been studies that have come out that said if we had ever an economic problem, 
where people had to spend like 400 bucks to kind of keep their family afloat, a good chunk of Americans in today's world uh, would face bankruptcy in that sort of situation. Um, the, the situation we have now then is similar to what they had back then, where on the surface in the 1920s, things look great. People have radios, they have cars, they have houses. They're buying all that stuff on credit. And the United States government is encouraging people to buy using loans because they keep the interest rates from the Federal Reserve really super low to encourage this sort of borrowing. And so we watch people borrow for homes, cars, radios, even stocks. And we've been giving money to Europe, especially with the freaky Dawes plan that we learned about where when Germany was having trouble making reparations payments and England and France had trouble paying back their debts, we'd send loans to Germany. So they'd then repay France and England. They would then pay us. And as a result, the economy is going to crash out. Stock market crash first. Then there's a run on the banks. Dust bowl happens for farmers. Businesses start laying off workers. And with Herbert Hoover, remember his response when it comes to the effects on the economy, Herbert Hoover is going to start off initially by saying we should be ruggedly individualistic. He then starts trying to give loans to businesses to keep people employed, which is what the stimulus was that President Trump just gave out recently. He just gave out loans to businesses and he told them, you can have this money for free as long as you don't lay off your workers. Many of those businesses now are putting pressure on the government to reopen our economy because they're realizing even with those loans, they're facing bankruptcy in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so as a result, we're now facing the possible reopening during a pandemic um, because of a, a, a technique that Herbert Hoover used as well in the past. The businesses would like to keep people employed, but without demand, they can't keep people employed. And, and in our situation right now, to create demand, we would need to leave our houses and go shopping. And that's not what a lot of people are prepared to do because they're afraid of disease. Back during this time period, there's not a lot of demand because the demand had been created by credit, people borrowing money that they assumed they'd be able to pay back from their jobs. So at the end of Herbert Hoover's presidency, you saw him moving towards creating uh, civil works projects, especially like Hoover Dam. But then when we get to FDR and his New Deal, FDR's New Deal is going to argue that the government needs to create stimulus. We need to create demand. And that stimulus right here is going to be surrounded, surrounding the three R's. We need relief, recovery, and reform. What I would do is I would put into my margin the New Deal could easily be compared and contrasted back to the progressive era, where for the progressive era, both the progressives and the New Deal focus on reform. The Great Depression, though, is going to force the New Deal to also do massive relief and recovery efforts to try to bring the economy around. It's been interesting watching recently, though, because for President Trump especially and for many conservatives, they've been pretty harsh on the New Deal. But if you've listened to President Trump recently, he's been very proud that he passed the largest stimulus bill ever created ever in U.S. history after spending the previous three years being very angry about liberals doing that sort of stuff and bringing us to towards socialism. We are in very unusual times. And so we are trying to create a, a stimulus inside of our economy. And that's what they've been trying to do to mimic what FDR was up to during his time period. For our government right now, they're also using what we learn about called Keynesian economics, which is what's developed as a result of watching the Great Depression, where John Maynard Keynes will argue that what failed during the Great Depression was we didn't spend enough money. Um, FDR is going to be super worried about debt. He's going to be worried about uh, going too deeply in debt. Um, he's worried uh, about a couple different elements. He's getting attacked by conservatives, both on the Supreme Court and in Congress, both Republicans and Southern Democrats, who are worried that we're drifting towards socialism and gigantic debt problems. You've also got on the other side, though, the people that we learned about. And if you remember the study chart that I gave you, it would be a really good idea to look at that electronic study chart that I gave, where you summarized each of the New Deal programs and you wrote onto the margin, was it a relief or a recovery or a reform program? But what we highlighted was that FDR felt the urge to be more liberal than what previous presidents had done because of people like Charles Coughlin, 
Francis Townsend, and especially Huey Long. Those three names are ones that you should be able to talk about who wanted FDR to go much further in what he was going to do uh, to fix the Great Depression. We want to remember that the New Deal did not end the Great Depression. What it did do, though, is it created a stimulus to try to provide aid. It created reforms that worked for multiple decades to prevent deep crashes from taking place by regulating our banking industry, like the Glass-Steagall Act, or regulating our, our, uh, our stock market, like the Security and Exchange Commission. But also, it created this political re realignment where many groups like African Americans, working class individuals who had typically been Republicans since the Civil War, many of them liked the idea that what, by incorporating things that could be seen as socialism, um, some of those ideas seem to be just common sense reforms to help out working people, like FDIC, insurance on your bank accounts to make sure that you're not bankrupted when the economy crashes, Social Security that guarantees that even though you're not going to get a comfortable retirement with Social Security, you won't be in intense poverty. What we do want to understand, though, is it's going to be World War II that is going to end our Great Depression. Massive stimulus spending by the government to ramp up production. Um, and very much, this is what many people are asking President Trump to consider during this time period where we've looked at in the past when we've had wartime footings that we've needed to step up to, we did have the government both during World War I and World War II massively increase production of materials to get us involved in a war effort. At this time, it was known as the arsenal of democracy to build tanks and planes and bombs. Many people are looking to President Trump who are more liberal in their perspectives to start building like ventilators or testing kits or whatever at a much faster rate. Um, and it's very much bringing us back to that same question of what should the federal government versus the state government be doing to fix the economy. As we look between World War I and World War II, it says here, explain the similarities and differences in attitudes about the nation's proper role in war. We are going to do it during this time period, engage in isolationism. Remember the Kellogg-Briand Pact that made war illegal. Remember the uh, the uh, negotiations like the Washington Naval Conference that said that we were going to keep our Navy small um, and Japan decided to ignore those agreements and make their Navy bigger, making us vulnerable. For many people outside the country, then many places like Nazi Germany, imperialistic Japan are going to take our isolationism as a sign of weakness, especially when Europe is involved in appeasement. And they're allowing Germany and Japan to be aggressive without any sort of consequences to their behavior. The League of Nations was expected to step in to try to stop that, but they were not doing it. When we move to World War II, America is going to get drawn into World War II um, by Pearl Harbor in 1941, but World War II starts in 1939. So it says here, explain how and why U.S. participation in World War II transformed American uh, society you should be able to discuss these transitions. Germany invaded Poland in 1939 in conjunction with Russia. Germany then started threatening France, and it's at that time America created the cash and carry policy to get around the neutrality acts that were trying to tie the hands of Franklin Roosevelt. When France fell and England was getting attacked, FDR created the destroyers for bases deal and the Lend-Lease Act to start sending aid to England to try to provide them aid to help them out. So before we ever get into World War II, we had already started mobilizing our economy by becoming the arsenal of democracy. And what Adolf Hitler learned in 1932, that he could employ every unemployed person as a soldier or a factory worker, that's going to be the thing that helps America get out of their Great Depression. One of the things that I've been wondering about recently, we've got all of these products that we need to start building out when it comes to our coronavirus. And in particular, we're not the only country that's going to get sick. Africa, Asia, the Middle East, all these places around the world are going to get coronavirus as well. If we were looking to stimulate our economy, we could start hiring workers to start building stuff like personal protection equipment or ventilators or testing kits or whatever. Um, if we wanted to transform our society in a World War II style footing, um, that would take an awful lot of government involvement. 
um, in an FDR sort of style, which many conservatives would not be super excited about doing, but it would create a gigantic stimulus for our economy to try to ramp up in that fashion. Um, this kind of plays out for you in modern day terms. We are still debating on what the approach to a global crisis should be. Um, and we still don't have agreement on that. We will find during World War II, women and minorities are going to find their socioeconomic situations changing. We will have a second great migration of African-Americans from South to North. We will have women moving from the home into the factory, think Rosie the Riveter. But we do have Japanese Americans who are being put into internment camps because of Executive Order 9066. Um, but we will also have Mexicans moving across the border into the United States with the Bracero program. And some are coming over undocumented, but they're still employed by American farms and factories because we are so desperate for workers. And so we're going to have a lot of movement and a lot of change happening socioeconomically as a result of the war. When it comes to the war effort itself, the causes and effects of the United States victory, you are going to have a mobilization in World War II. And even though we got attacked by Pearl Harbor, um, with the Japanese, we are going to develop what's called the ABC-1 plan, the America-British-Canada-1 plan, where we're going to focus on defending Europe first, because if we can defend Britain and eventually Russia and eventually get France back on their feet, they could then help us to uh, defeat the Japanese as one gigantic group using all of their imperial possessions. Remember that when we went into war, we were also noticing that there was horrible things happening um, with the Japanese who would fight to the death using their Bushido code and they would torture American soldiers. Um, we had the Nazi concentration camps and the Holocaust taking place, which gave the moral feeling of, of superiority to the United States, that they were defending democracy and goodness and human rights. Um, this is also going to create then pressure to address our civil rights issues because it's hard to maintain this level of rightness while also embracing racism back at home. We will have, like I mentioned here, opportunities for women and African-Americans to be able to move not just into the factories, but also in the military. And other uh, 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 ethnic groups will also start finding opportunities in the military to demonstrate themselves as well. The United States are going to uh, have victories in Europe first. So they're gonna move through Africa, Italy, then D-Day, and then they'll move through Europe. And in the Pacific, they'll be using island hopping to get close enough to Japan where they can start dropping bombs, including the atomic bombs that we studied in class. The final element that they want to be able to talk about is how do we transition from World War II into a period of post-war Cold War um, where America is going to emerge as a superpower. And in particular, if I was going to ask you to do compare contrast here, compare and contrast in the Cold War to what we had with in, in between World War I and World War II with our isolationism. This easily could be a DBQ topic about isolationism that could allow you to play with this as like a post-contextualization, but they've now highlighted this in itself, in itself, Yalta, Potsdam, the United Nations, and so on, could be part of an essay question that they give you for period seven. As we look at period seven, then it says here that a potential question could be compare the relative significance of the major events of the first half of the 20th century in shaping American identity. We will first of all see that we have our economic systems develop in the early 1900s, where we do have a booming farm system that can mass produce. We have to figure out how to take care of the farmers though economically. And during the FDR time period, we are going to build out things like subsidies for farmers and other sorts of, of production acts that will make it so that you can farm with stability in the United States while supplying the food for a more and more industrial economy. People start moving more and more to the city. During the early 1900s, we start putting into place common sense reforms. And even our most conservative people nowadays rarely talk about getting rid of the, the most popular reforms of the progressive era like the Pure Food and Drug Act, the Meat Inspection Act, the, the antitrust legislation that broke up our biggest um, and most abusive monopolies. And then when it comes to the, the Great Depression, we do find that while Americans like having a strong economy, um, they also demonstrate during FDR's time period that they like the idea of safety nets and regulations that are making sure that we aren't going back to complete laissez-faire economics um, with no safety nets or, 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 or protections 
uh, for workers or for, for the weaker in our society. We do have massive technological change that they'll want to be able to discuss that leads us into the Cold War time period where we are going to become very much a powerful and influential country. And then as we move into foreign conflicts, the lesson that we learn from all of this sort of stuff, imperialism, World War I, isolationism, World War II, is the lesson learned is the Truman Doctrine, that America can't just sit by the wayside and watch the rest of the world. Because if we leave a vacuum, then that opens up the door for dictators and other bad actors. Um, and what we've discovered is our world has gotten quite small. As you can see with 9-11, um, you can have people from the other side of the world with our new transportation technologies be able to attack the United States. Um, and given the world that we're in with computer technology, um, we are incredibly vulnerable to cyber attack right now from around the world without anybody needing to move anything but a, a push of their button um, and, and away we go. So that was period seven. Um, and my hope is that this stuff, as we move closer and closer to the end, became more and more familiar to you. Um, but I'm gonna check back to my chat. I don't see any questions that are here. Um, so I, my hope is that this stuff feels better for you. And, and in particular, what I was promising you um, at the end of the time that we were together in the classroom is the point that I made was big picture. Period six, period seven, most likely is stuff that you were in your groove, your note taking was good, you figure out your study strategies. And so if you are being successful in class, most likely that content isn't the place where you need to spend lots of time reviewing. Periods three, four, five, though, most likely are things that are a little bit shaky, a little bit older, and they might be a little bit more confusing and require more review time for yourself. I would, though, remind you about a few different things. Number one, you do have content gaps. This, this, your notes, other online tools, the schedule that they've got up for the AP uh, review sessions, all of that stuff would be great for you to start reviewing. Because when I was reading your writing, I didn't see a lot of people who didn't know how to write a DBQ. I saw a lot of people though, whose content knowledge needs to get stronger. So that you've got enough tools to be able to write out a good essay to make a, a reader be impressed by what you're up to. Tomorrow then also remember that you've got your chronological reasoning, your decades association that I want to get done. And again, this will take you a little bit of time, but this is meant to be a big overview about the stuff that you guys have, have learned about over the course of the year. And so let me bring you back to this document before I turn you guys loose. With this document, again, if you see any terms that are on here that you don't know from the periods three through eight or what might be contextualization, like all of the stuff that you see going on right here could easily be played into a civil rights essay question from the early 1900s, that this could be used as post-contextualization. I would make sure to look it up, Google search it, and Google is quick, so don't hit your notes, but just go up and open up a page, look it up on Wikipedia, put down the dates, check them afterwards to make sure that you've got them accurate, um, and then figure out how are you doing with chronology? How are you doing with your, your studying? Um, and in particular, if you're finding that you have any sort of problems that are going on, remember that you've got me as a resource as well. I've had multiple of your classmates reach out to me and say that they want to do some sort of Google Meet um, because that's much easier than communicating via email. Um, and I'm happy to do that with you to talk through anything. If you want a concept explained, ideas uh, straightened out, questions taken care of, um, that's what I'm supposed to be here for you to do during the course of the day, in addition to grading out your DBQs and other sorts of things. So I'm going to turn you loose at this point, unless you have questions. Um, I will see you tomorrow at 8. And again, get the Decades Association done for tomorrow. And then tomorrow we start doing review activities in our class um, to start running through stuff that will help you become a better writer. Have a great day, guys.